This is a production of Cornell University. And thanks, Kevin, for inviting me. I really had a, a number of great talks this morning with people already. Um, so the title of my talk is about um, the role of the Andes in neotropical plant diversification. And uh, after I sent that title, I realized that I've only spent about six months working on this topic. And so um, what you'll see is a lot about lowland uh, rainforest diversification. And then um, the latter part focused more exclusively on the Andes, um, which, which is a sort of more recent development. Um, and as Kevin mentioned, I'm very interested in tropical forest biomes. Uh, this graphic will probably explain why. Uh, this shows the global distribution of tree diversity. Um, and we have three main biomes uh, here. We have our boreal forests represented in blue. We have our, our temperate zone forests in red. And we have our tropical forests in green. And each of these boxes represents the number of species of trees in each of these regions. And this, these numbers on the side indicate the total tally. So you can see 161 species, uh, about 1,600 species here, and then 43,000 species in the tropical realm. So it's a huge uh, diversity in global terms in tropical forests. Um, and then when you think not at the regional or continental scale, but at a very local scale, there are many species that are packed into very small areas in tropical forests. So in this forest in, uh, in Ecuador, um, Al Gentry noted that there were 300 tree species, all above 10 centimeters in diameter, in a single hectare of forest. So this has been a topic that's been interesting to biologists uh, for over a century. There are two main ways to approach this question of why is there so much tropical diversity. One is through an ecological approach, which would focus on why there are so many species coexisting in small areas that would be focused on competition or bivory. Um, the other way approach would be to look at the evolutionary history of those forests. And that, that's sort of the main area uh, that my lab is interested in. Um, so, so the overall talk outline, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the history of the tropical forest biome. Um, I'm going to talk more exclusively about rainforests, and particularly work that I've done on the phylogeography of widespread rainforest trees. Um, and then finally, I'm going to talk about Andean plant diversification and its role in sort of creating all of this diversity. <clears throat> so if we think about tropical forest history, we, we have to go back to um, Alfred Russell Wallace. And uh, he noticed you know, way back in the 19th century that one reason why tropical forests probably had so much diversity is because they've been so stable as a biome. Not only do they not have these very bitter winters and you know, dormancy that's required of, of plants and animals, but also over geological time periods, they've been much more stable. So they haven't been recently wiped out by glacial, glacial activity. Um, and so if we think about the geological history of tropical forests, I want to just pre prevent, present a little overview um, this will take us back, sort of starting at the KT boundary. KT boundary is where we at least have fossil records that we know we had forests that are similar to modern forests. So at the KT boundary and beyond in the Paleogene, we have, um, uh, here is our representative of uh, tropical forests. And since we're already outside of the tropical region, we have to give another name for these forests. Uh, this is what we call megathermal forests. So these are forests that cannot endure any kind of freezing. They, they are, they are warmth-loving. So the megathermal forests extended all the way up into New York, Michigan uh, during the Paleogene. And so there's a much greater expansion of forests um, from uh, 65 uh, to 24 million years ago. Uh, and this is because the Earth was much warmer. And there was less of a latitudinal gradient in changes in temperature. And we know that from fossil records in Colombia, the tropical forests were highly diverse, uh, even in this very early stage of rainforest development, as diverse probably as today, at least at the generic level, level of genera. <clears throat> if we look at the Neogene, sort of the past 24 million years until the beginning of the ice ages, um, we had many important developments. Uh, forests, the megathermal forests sort of shrank and contracted into the equatorial regions so now they're mostly within this tropical area. 
Um, but we see a lot of developments geologically. We see the, the emergence of the Isthmus of Panama, which is a land bridge that connects South America and North America, allowing for the Great American Biotic Interchange. Um, we see the development of the Andes Mountains during this, this period in time. Um, and so this is important in terms of the development of sort of South American uh, landscapes. And then finally, the Quaternary, um, the past 2.6 million years, this is a period marked by major climatic fluctuations, glacial, interglacial periods. And when there were glacial periods, that's when the forests sh shrank the most in their 65 million year history um, to much smaller extents than they were in the past 65 million years. Um, and this led to the development of the Pleistocene Refuge Hypothesis, which posited that the contraction of these rainforests would have led to an accelerated rate of speciation uh, during the past um, 2.6 million years. And so this is the overall view. Um, if we look back 65 million years to present, uh, this is, these are uh, proxies for temperature, global mean temperature, and this represents a higher temperature. So the, the peak temperature was a sort of Paleocene-Eocene boundary. And then uh, our global temperatures have got increasingly cool over the Cenozoic. And now they're, they're moving back up into these areas. Uh, but, the area, but the temperatures that are predicted for the year 2100 are similar to some of the temperatures that we see here in this Neogene time frame. And they're even warmer uh, earlier in the Earth's history. <coughs> uh, one thing that we discovered in, in just looking at the, the phylogenies of, in the biogeographic history of the major families that comprise rainforests it, there's been a lot of movement across continents of rainforest lineages. <clears throat> so even though we think of uh, South America as being isolated uh, for tens of millions of years, there's actually been dispersal events that have been significant, and then that have resulted in the invasions of um, continental biotas. Um, <clears throat> very quick um, depiction of continental drift. Um, <laughs> that's about 65 million years worth of movement. and uh, at three million years ago, we have Panama connecting North America, and so we have this uh, Great American Biotic Interchange. But at many points throughout the past 65 million years, there have been migration events while uh, South America was an island continent, including from these megathermal forests that were in North America and Europe, which we call the Boreotropics, uh, from Asian forests, from Africa. And um, Toby Pennington and I tried to quantify the impact of this migration and we looked at the Yasuni forest inventory plot, which is 25 hectares, has 1,100 species. And we estimated that 30% of the tree species and about 30% of the biomass, the actual stem counts, came from immigrant lineages. Um, um, so, so a very important impact of long distance dispersal. <coughs> so this led to, so there are two major ideas when I was a graduate student that I, that I had thought about, the, about tropics. And the one that is associated with Alfred Russell Wallace is that the tropics are a kind of museum of biological diversity. Because of the sta stability of this biome and their long history and being even more expansive than they are today, species would be able to accumulate over time without much of an extinction rate. And so uh, under this model, you'd expect to have fairly old lineages that go all the way back through the Cenozoic. But under a cradle model, this is where these other ideas about you know, the impact of potential Pleistocene refugia coming into play, or maybe you know, more recent geological developments driving speciation. Under those models, the, the tropics may be an area of active speciation with high extinction rates, where you would expect most of the diversity to be more recent in origin. And that's kind of broadly called a cradle model. And we can represent that um, phylogenetically under a museum model. If we think back through the Cenozoic from the present back to the KT boundary or the KPG boundary, uh, under a museum model, we'd expect uh, common ancestors of our, our species and genera to sort of coalesce going way back through the past 65 million years. Whereas under a cradle model, we expect very small branch lengths and more recent diversification. An example of the, uh, the cradle model was found in, in the genus Inga. So Inga is a tree genus, about 300 tree species, only found in neotropical forests. 
Most of the species are widely distributed and morphologically very distinctive from one another. Um, and Toby Pennington, James Rich Richardson, and colleagues tried to work out a phylogeny and found that they couldn't work out the phylogeny. There was not enough phylogenetic resolution, not enough genetic divergence among the species. And they placed the, the, the genus phylogeny into the broader legume phylogeny and estimated that the genus arose six to 10 million years ago with two-thirds of the species originating uh, during quaternary, uh, which was consistent with sort of a Pleistocene refuge hypothesis. And they, they suggested that you know, this, is, this may be the case with most Amazon tree species, that uh, most Amazon trees may actually be very recent in origin. So my, my supervisor, postdoc uh, collaborator at the time, and I were invited to write a perspective piece in science for this article, and it just didn't strike us as being very realistic. And the reason being is that uh, when we think about the forests that we were familiar with in Bar Colorado Island and Yasuni, uh, there's a very deep taxonomic structure. So not only are there lots of species, but at higher levels, of the level of genus and families, there's also a lot of higher level taxonomic diversity. So that, for example, in this Yasuni forest, with our 1,100 tree species in, in a 25 hectare plot, there are 333 genera and 81 families of plants represented. And so we can look at the distributions of how many um, species there are per genus on the average. So about 160 of those genera are represented by a single species. And many of those genera are, in fact, monotypic. There are many genera that only have a single or one or two or three or four species. They're species poor. And so Inga is actually the extreme, extreme outlier. It's a genus that has 43 species in this forest plot. So uh, in this regard, Inga was something of an outlier. And so at the time, I was doing phylogeographic work. And I became interested, in particular, in widespread, widely distributed species uh, that were found in both in Central America and in South America. And also thinking about the age structure of some of these species-poor genera. And so my, my first work was focused on Symphonia globulifera. This is a, a species in the Clusiaceae. Um, it's very distinctive in rainforests. Uh, it's something that I, as a graduate student, I, I saw it frequently in Manaus, Brazil. As a postdoc, I saw it in Panama. When I visited French Guiana, I saw it in forest plots there. I saw it in, in Yasuni. Uh, everywhere I traveled, I saw it. And, and, and interestingly enough, it's also very common and widespread in Africa. Um, it has a very distinctive morphology, which is very important because when there's a thousand trees in a forest, you want to be able to identify your species no matter which forest you're in. So I could always identify it through a combination of characters, these aerial buttress, uh, these aerial roots, and a sort of a bright orange latex, very distinctive globular flower. Um, <clears throat> and another really useful point about Symphonia there's only one species of Symphonia found in the Neotropics. And it has a very distinctive pollen type. And the pollen has been used extensively by the oil industry for stratigraphy. So if they want to uh, find a character that, that indicates that there's rainforest in a particular region or find the age of a particular site, they often look for Symphonia pollen. So we ha actually have a pretty good record of the fossil distribution of Symphonia relative to other rainforest trees. So um, at the time there were, that I was doing the study, there were no phylogeographic studies of, of tropical plants, the tropical trees. Um, and one of the things that drew me to phylogeography was, was traveling. And so I, I was able to visit a lot of these sites, visit forests that I hadn't seen before, collect symphonia. And then I relied on herbarium material to, to fill in the gaps. I got herbarium material from Africa and from other locations. Um, and I use standard plant systematic markers, ITS, chloroplast DNA, um, not knowing that these would even be variable within this species. So this is a, these show the sites that I visited. And this is actually based on ITS, internal transcribed spacer sequence. And each of these colors represents a distinct haplotype or sequence. And these, uh, these circles sort of show the clustering of where the related haplotypes occurred. Um, so there's an Amazonian group, uh, a, 
an area west of the Andes and up through Central America that's highly diverse but constitutes a clade, uh, a West Indian clade, and then this, this African group. And this shows the fossil history. So Symphonia fossil pollen first occurs about 45 million years ago off the coast of Nigeria. So very old as a genus at least. The first neotropical records are off the coast of Brazil and in the Maracaibo Basin in Venezuela at about 15 million years ago. And then in Central America, we have the first fossils appearing about 8 million years ago. So just based on that fossil information alone, um, we can infer that there had been some oceanic dispersal event that led to the establishment of Symphony in the Amazon Basin sometime in the Miocene. Um, because the West Indies have always been islands, and this is a very distinctive genetic group, this would have had to have derived either from South America or from Africa. And then there, there, there had to have been, assuming that there was no Isthmus of Panama 8 million years ago, there would have had to have been dispersal from South America into Central America by oceanic currents. This is a phylogenetic reconstruction of Symphonia. And all the other species of Symphonia, besides Symphonia globulifera, are found in Madagascar. There are about 20 species of Symphonia in Madagascar, and then one species everywhere else. These are the, Madagasc the Madagascan species. And these are uh, the clades within West Africa, and then sister to this neotropical group. So there's a clade that's just sort of in the Amazon region and Guiana Shield, and then one that's in the Transandes. I use the 15 million year fossils to sort of calibrate this clade, and that um, gave me you know, approximately 7 million years of the age of the Central American group, which is consistent with the fossil record. So the thing to note about this is we have this very high level of phylogenetic resolution and phylogenetic depth within a single widespread species. And the species is actually older than the entire genus of Inga, which has 300 species. It's a, it's a genus that it co-occurs with in just about every forest. But it's a very old species. And uh, when, I, when I published this work, uh, the editor of the journal said, well, this is really a living fossil. You, know, you should sort of sell it as a living fossil. It's very unusual. It's just unchanged morphologically for such a long period of time. The other interesting thing was what it revealed about oceanic dispersal leading to sort of the assembly patterns of these, of these forests. So obviously I had this great result and I wanted to uh, see what I could learn about other widespread species. Um, so the next one that I looked at was Saba pentandra. Now Saba you might be familiar with is the Kapok tree. Um, it's one of the most enormous trees that you'll find in the Amazon basin. Um, this is a selfie taken by Robin Foster, um, back in about 1966 on, on BCI in Panama, Bar Colorado Island. This tree just fell down last year, unfortunately. This is called Big Tree. Um, you can see it's got these huge buttress roots. <laughs> and uh, it's got these, uh, these little seeds that are wrapped in sort of a cottony silk. Um, it's very fast growing. It grows up to two meters per year. Uh, it sort of establishes along river banks. And the largest ones are along the, the Solomoyes River in the Amazon Basin with nutrient-rich areas. A um, little bit of natural history. I love natural history. It keeps me going. Um, this is bat pollination of Symphonia, taken by, a photo taken by a colleague of mine in Brazil. So what I found with Symphonia is a very different pattern. So using those same sets of molecular markers, uh, this is another haplotype map. Um, the bottom part shows the chloroplast DNA. Um, so the chloroplast DNA, using the most variable chloroplast region, was entirely monomorphic. In other words, no variation throughout Central America, Amazon Basin, and Africa. Absolutely no DNA sequence variation. Just one nucleotide variant in the west coast of Ecuador. And there were some ITS haplotypes, but showing no phylogeographic pattern whatsoever. And it turns out that the other species of Saba are located in uh, the Amazon basin. There are several other species. So the species likely originated in South America, and it, it got through long distance dispersal, um, probably through oceanic currents, arrived in Africa. We know that it arrived in Africa before pre-Columbian times, because there are records of uh, Arab traders moving the species in the 10th century into Asia. Um, 
So it naturally got into Africa, um, but over a very recent time scale in very weak phylogeographic structure. And probably not a very old species um, in general. <clears throat> so then I became, well, OK, we have these extreme cases. We have one widespread species that's very charismatic and well-known, but a very recent in origin. Um, and we have another one that, that's very ancient. And everywhere you go, it shows deep phylogeographic breaks and divergence. Um, and so I, I wanted to understand more about these patterns. And I decided to focus particularly on looking at the Andean bear barrier um, and looking at populations that were located on either side of the Andes uh, in northern South America. And this, this was fascinating to me. I was in Ecuador, and I was reading the catalog of the vascular plants of Ecuador. And I came across a quote by Peter Raven, and he indicated that you know, right when they were tallying the plant diversity, they said that 30% uh, of the plants found in lowland rainforests in Ecuador are found on both sides of the Andes. <coughs> and so that, that account, that's about 1,400 species. So he said that about 30% of the lowland flora has been around prior to the uplift of the Andes. And that, may, that means that a large portion of these ecological communities have been really stable for several millions of years, because the Andes are several million years old. So I was really interested in this idea and thinking, wow, there must be large components that are very old in these rainforest communities. Um, and this is a situation known as vicariance, when you have a widespread population, and then it's sort of broken up when a, a barrier, a geographic barrier rises in the middle of it. That's called vicariance. So that vicariance history would indicate that these populations would have uh, a neogene age, It'd be going back prior to the Pleistocene. Um, and so we have our, our northernmost Andes. These are sort of the most recent part of the Andes to form in, in Merida. Um, this would have been the final barrier that would have been presented. And the uplift of Merida Andes is about 2.7 million years ago, sort of right between where the neogene and the quaternary are. And so uh, as a way to test this, I looked at uh, estimated the ages of the ancestors of these populations. And if they fell well within this neogene period, that would support Andean vicariance. Um, if they were well in the quaternary, that would indicate some kind of dispersal to get around the Andes. And I just want to note that uh, not only are the Andes important as an elevational barrier, but also uh, right beside the Andes, you have this really dry area, the Llanos. And so any plant that uh, is able to get around the Andes is going to have to deal in some way with drought, you know, with drying, dry habitats. Um, so I picked, um, I had 14 study species. Some of them were dealt with in individual case studies, were sampled much more broadly. But for all the species, I at least sampled in Panama, Western Ecuador, and Eastern Ecuador using these same sets of molecular markers. Um, in, that included Seva pentandra, Symphonia globulifera, um, as well as some other species that are fairly well known, like uh, Ochroma, which is the balsa wood producing tree. Um, Jacaranda, well known for its flowers. <clears throat> and I also looked at, oh, actually, a student of mine, Jordan Bemmels, looked at some functional traits associated with these trees. So he looked at drought tolerance uh, through ecological niche modeling. We looked at where these species were found. Some of them, like Symphonia globulifera, were only found in the wettest forests, true rainforest, whereas others were found. Uh, in drier forest areas. They were found in seasonally dry forest, indicating they had more drought tolerant abilities. We also looked at some other characters, um, functional traits. <coughs> so the results were that nine out of the 14 species had uh, a neogene aged population structure. So they had population histories that went back uh, before 3 million years ago. Um, none of these species had much morphological variation, uh, despite these deep temporal divergences among these populations. And we also noticed that there was this association. The species that did manage to somehow get around the, the Andes during the Quaternary, um, those tend to be the, the drought-tolerant species. Um, and now we're currently looking at more species. We have 85 species altogether that are shared between the BCI and the, and the Yasini forest. And we're using other molecular markers, particularly RADSeq DNA, to analyze these divergences. <clears throat> 
But this figure just gives you an idea. This goes back through this 10 million year history. Um, and we can see here's the age for our cross -Ande Andean divergence of Symphonia globulifera. And it's not even the oldest species. You know, there are several species that have higher levels of genetic divergence between their cross Andean populations than Symphonia does. Um, there's this group particular down here that's very old. Um, then we have a couple species that are sort of the Pliocene, Pleistocene boundary. And then we have a group that definitely seem to have their origin in the Quaternary, or sort of younger. Um, but you can see some of the things that species like Symphonia have experienced. They've experienced warmth, global warmth, uh, warmer temperatures than are expected for the year 2100, or global climate change. Um, they've experienced the uplift of the Andes, the development of the Merida Andes, uh, the closure of the Isthmus of Panama. These have been species that have been part of a rainforest for all this period. And this just shows this sort of how the drought tolerant and intolerant species sort of segregate out. So the drought, you know, all the youngest species are drought tolerant, indicating that maybe that have played a role in, in allowing them to get around the Andes. So the Andes is really a filter, sort of lets the drought tolerant species through but it keeps the rainforest specialists on either side and separated. <clears throat> so um, this isn't Alfred Russell Wallace's quote. This is mine. Um, and it's just to say that alongside species like Inga, which definitely do represent recent diversification in kind of a cradle mode, there are many living fossil, fossil lineages, many lineages that are just hanging out in the rainforest for millions of years without much notable morphological or ecological divergence. OK, so where, where do the Andes fit in? We've seen how they fit in as a barrier. Um, but they actually contribute a whole lot more to neotropical plant diversity. So here we have our, our original photo, and here we have the, uh, the Andes. <coughs> so there are estimated 45,000 uh, plant species in the Andes. 44% um, of those are endemic to the Andean region. So that's a huge amount of the overall contribution to neotropical plant diversity that's localized on the Andes. And there are many, many important linkages geologically between the Amazon and the Andes. And I've explored these a lot recently in collaboration with geologists um, who will dispute every point that I bring up today. But, but for the time being, I find this a very reasonable scenario. This is a review paper by Karina Horn from back in 2010. And it shows uh, the Cenozoic development of the Amazon basin, even before there was an Amazon river. So at the very beginning of the Cenozoic, um, 65 to 33 million years ago, th this is the Amazon drainage sort of moved in this direction. And um, it actually flowed probably out through where the Orinoco River is. And you see that there's not, the alpine habitat would be in red, so there's not much montane habitat at that point. It's just slowly developing. Um, and so as the Andes are uplifting, particularly these northern Andes, they're causing uh, these drainage patterns to shift. And they're causing to, at one point, shift northward, at one point, develop a large wetland system. Uh, until finally, they force the drainage to move eastward. And so we have the development of the modern Amazon River at about 10 million years ago. <clears throat> we have the continued rising up of the Andes. And as the Andes raise up, all of a sudden, it changes the climate. It adds new precipitation. There's a rain shadow effect. Uh, there's lots of moisture now newly available in this area. And it also changes global circulation patterns of air as well. Um, and it also changing the Amazon basin in a very important way by adding nutrient-rich sediments. So for the first time, you know, these are very ancient cratons that are sandy and not very nutrient-rich. All of a sudden, you have these new parent material rising up and depositing all kinds of sediments into this region. So it's changing ecosystem properties like, like carbon flux as well, as well as um, promoting different kind of ecological niche. And then finally, over the Quaternary, we have the development of the Llanos, this dry area. And then all of the 
climate changes that are associated with the ice ages. In terms of biogeographic processes, um, I've discussed a lot about how the Andes work as a barrier. Um, and it's a barrier to up to 30% of the rainforest species in Ecuador. It acts as a corridor, uh, particularly for temperate zone species to actually move into this region in northern South America. And potentially, most of them are, are residing in this region and, and speciating when they get here. But some of them actually do move into the lowlands. And of course, um, it's acting as a speciation pump or a cradle of diversification. Um, certainly, the alpine habitats have seen an incredible amount of diversification. Um, but I think that with these new sediments that were formed in the slopes of the Andes, I think that also promoted some diversification. And I think that may be where we have uh, Inga playing out, because Inga has its center of distribution as a genus on sort of this slope of the Andes. Um, and this is a great review paper um, by Lubert and Weigand that, that came out recently. There have been a lot of phylogenetic studies of clades in the Andean region. And they did a synthesis of the, of the studies, and they tried to place all the ones that had any kind of uh, age estimates associated with them into context, and they associated them with different regions of the Andes. So they separate the Andes into a northern region, uh, sort of a north central and central Andean region in the southern Andes. Um, and these are progressively younger as you move north, uh, southern Andes being potentially the oldest uh, part of the Andes. And <clears throat> if you kind of squint your eyes and you know, don't apply statistics, um, you can see that the southern Andes do have quite a lot of older lineages with ancestors that go back into the Miocene. And for the northern Andean clays, there actually are a lot that seem to have their origin in the Quaternary or, or, the, or the Pliocene. So it is you know, potentially possible that we'd be able to sort of find this association with the age of the mountain and the age of the clades that are associated with them. So this is a project that, um, uh, that I've recently begun participating in in this past year uh, with a group of geologists. And we, we had funding from NSF from uh, Frontiers in Earth System Dynamics. And um, the goal of it, they were geologists who were really interested in Amazon biodiversity and how it was generated. And they also know a lot about Andean history. And we wanted to get together a group of people that were experts in Andean uplift geomorphology, um, paleoclimatology, contemporary climates, ecosystem function. And they really wanted somebody that could contribute in terms of the, of the plant phylogenetic history um, or in phylogeographic history. So we've been meeting together regularly uh, and talking about these patterns. And, um, and some questions we have like in the plant side are, we want to know, like, what is the diversification that we see in Andean clades? Was that because these plants migrated into new habitat that was very open and didn't exist before? And they just immediately started occupying these novel habitats? Or, as some people have suggested, is it because these habitats are kind of like islands? So these mountaintops are like islands so that whenever you have climate change, these islands grow and sometimes coalesce and then shrink back again. And so this would be a kind of Pleistocene refuge model applied to the tops of the mountains. Um, so we wanted to know, sort of, what are some of those dri what, what is driving that diversification? And also, what are the major drivers of the diversification apart from allopatry um, with respect to ecological niche, um, important ecological traits? Some people, Al Gentry suggested that the ability to move into hummingbird pollination opened up a lot of ecological space for, for high elevation plants, as well as genomic evolution. Um, and then what is the contribution of the Andean so associated species with lowland rainforest diversity, thinking about Inga, you know, to what extent did this cradle of diversification impact Amazonian flora? So we, we actually will be gathering our own data pretty soon, starting this summer. Um, but over the past few months, what we've done is we've gone into the literature and we've done a meta-analysis of existing studies. 
And this is uh, in, done in collaboration with Stephen Smith. This is what, when you get a Gmail from him, this is how his face appears. And anybody who knows him knows that that's exactly what he looks like. And he's just like a beard and black glasses. Um, and this is his uh, undergraduate student, Carolyn, uh, who, who he's been actually getting to do all the work of developing scripts to pull out DNA sequences from GenBank, analyze them in large scale. And we've done these uh, diversification analyses that are based on um, techniques that were developed by Dan Roboski, who is actually a, a PhD student here very recently at the Laboratory of Ornithology. So um, any questions about this, he'll be giving a talk here in, in Cornell in a couple of weeks. So please hold your questions for him. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of mathematical magic that happens in there. That, um, But what this shows is a, um, a phylogenetic tree with sort of a, a heat map. And it shows when you have um, changes or significant shifts in the rate of diversification. Uh, diversification being sort of the, uh, the speciation rate minus the extinction rate. And this is the net impact. Um, and so here we have a fast rate of diversification uh, slowing down and then showing a significant slowdown, for example, in this clade. Um, here we have the Andean clade. This is the, the common ancestor of the Andean group, which is shown here with this uh, green dot. And there's actually no evidence for any change in the diversification rate when this group reaches the Andes. But this is the kind of thing that we're looking at with this data. Um, and blue being slow rate of diversification, yellow, medium, red is a rapid rate. So that, that example that I showed you there was Berberus. Um, you might be familiar with Japanese barberry, which is invasive in Michigan. Um, so when this genus reached the Andes, it, uh, it did speciate, but not in any rate that was different from the background rate of speciation in, in other geographic regions. <clears throat> uh, this is one of the classic papers, um, and a really important paper in um, sort of explosive diversification patterns in the Andes. And this is an, in the genus Lupinus in the lupins. Um, and here you can see uh, the geographic distribution of these lupins. And uh, as soon as they hit the Andes, represented in orange, you see very, very short branch lengths and lots of species, you know, similar to that Inga tree. So a very recent explosive uh, phylogenetic diversification accompanied by incredible diversification at the morphological level. So these are some of the, uh, some of the plants that evolved during that radiation. So including everything from herbaceous to, to trees. Uh, this all evolved within a quaternary time scale. Um, some of the fastest diversification rates that were measured um, for plants or animals were published in that paper. So when we look at, um, we pull out all the all the sequences from GenBank for the lupins from all over the world. We put them in a phylogenetic tree. Um, we can see that across all lupins, there are some areas, and some of this might be affected by sample size as well, that are, are slower, uh, slower evolving or more quickly evolving. And here we have our Andean group right here. But you can see that there's really no evidence for any significant rate change. Uh, lupins evolved very rapidly in the Andes, but they were already evolving very rapidly in the Rocky Mountains, already evolving very rapidly in the, in the Mexican mountains. And when they were in the Andes, they just continued to evolve very rapidly. And um, in all fairness, the, the authors do recognize that in the subsequent paper. So this is just a general pattern of lupin biology, not necessarily something that's specific to the Andes. Um, Draba is a, is a group that does show a strong signature of Andean diversification. So um, compared to all the taxa that are outside of the Andes, when it hits the Andes, it, it's, it, it, it has a, a significantly increased rate of diversification. <coughs> Festuca. Um, this is another one that shows a strong signature of Andean diversification. But you also see that it shows a significant slowdown. So it diversified initially very quickly compared to the rest of the clade of Festuca. But then diversification rates slowed down. 
And so this would indicate to me that potentially this is a group that diversified initially as these plants came into the novel habitat, but they weren't necessarily affected by the climatic fluctuations of the Pleistocene. <coughs> Valeriana sh shows a similar pattern where it, it showed a significant increase in diversification initially, uh, followed by a slowdown uh, to the present. So uh, the initial results of the, this meta-analysis, um, that there's quite a lot of variability. Um, some groups come in, they speciate to some degree, uh, not any different from the background level of speciation. Some groups come in and show real rampant radiations. Um, some of them show radiations and then stasis over uh, coming into more recent time scales, indicating that probably uh, my hypothesis is that they're diversifying initially as they reach these new habitats, but they're not terribly impacted by Pleistocene climate changes. <coughs> so the future works. Um, um, my colleague Stephen Smith's really interested in, in incorporating as much data, ecological data, as is possible into these analyses, including biogeographic data. So we want to look at, <coughs> excuse me, um, the ecological correlates of these rate increases. Um, <coughs> we would like to also do more transcriptomic work. Uh, we want to uh, look at the genus Clusia, uh, which is in the, in the Clusiaceae. This is one of the only. Uh, tree lineages that has CAM photosynthesis, which allows it to photosynthesize in very dry periods. It has a combination of C3 and CAM photosynthesis. And this is a genus that shows high levels of species turnover as you move up slopes in the Andes. And so we're interested in looking at the evolution of that photosynthetic mechanism and how some of these may have impacted um, evolutionary uh, divergences within the Andes. And we're also interested in working with the geologists to better pull together uh, geological history with the plant phylogenetic history. In particular, um, biologists have been working for a long time thinking that some of the high elevation habitats like the Paramo are a certain age, you know, a maximum of five million years. But these geologists say that uh, the ages of the eastern and western cordilleras of the Andes are very different. And in the western parts of the Andes, which are sort of a volcanic origin uh, as opposed to origin by uh, faulting, um, that these might have a much deeper history. So we want to see if we can find clades that are much deeper um, in age than 5 million years. Um, so I'd like to particularly thank uh, Stephen and Carolyn, my graduate student Jordan and postdoc Ashley Thompson, and my uh, geological geogenomics <laughs> colleagues. And I'd be happy to take any questions. So at one point, you mentioned uh, genomic correlates that you're interested in exploring. Would you like to elaborate a little more on what you're thinking about? Well, one thing that, um, that Stephen is doing now is developing phylogenies based on transcriptomics. So he'll take uh, the transcribed genes, there might be 16,000 of them from a number of lineages, and then form, perform phylogenetic analyses of those various uh, genetic groups. And you can look to see if there are certain groups, certain genes that are outliers or evolving much more quickly on you know, deeper branch lengths. Um, and so that might be one way to sort of get at what, what are the actual functions that are evolved that are evolving more quickly than others in some of these groups that might precede diversification or enable the plant moving in the ecological space. So that, that would be one aspect. Yeah. What about things like looking at uh the living fossil lineages versus the more dispersal, uh, well dispersed lineages for rates of change. Has anything been done with those, like if you're in Symphonia, for example? Well, one that. thing that I'm very interested in is looking below the surface of species like Symphonia. I mean, I find it hard to believe that in such a biotically challenging environment, such as a tropical forest, with huge amounts of pest pressure, pathogens, insect damage you know, constantly, um, that there would be a lot of evolution happening that may have to do with secondary defense or other traits that we're just not seeing in taxonomical. So I, I think that would be very interesting to look at.
Uh, the last few examples you presented, uh, with Barabras, Pastuca, et cetera, um, and uh, the relative rate changes in speciation events. I was wondering if there uh, is a higher level pattern of herbaceous and woody and that they fall out into these categories initially and then you're looking at patterns within mm -hmm. each category. That, that's a really good question. And um, I, I think I would need to look at that. Uh, these are just the initial results now, but it's a very good point. So they're all on the same scale then? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if some of those groups, um, and it's certainly with the lupins, there are some woody elements there. But I'm not sure if that applies to the other, whether it was the herbaceous uh, or woody, um, and how that affected their speciation rates. I mean, I would expect there to be less a lower rate for the woody um, for some reason, but it does a longer generation times and things like that. But um, we're looking for the checks going on. This is a more general and maybe like naive question about species diversification. But uh, after something like a long distance dispersal, dispersal event, mm -hmm. you know, you might expect that species to like diversify when it reaches its new ecosystem. But do you also see a drop in uh, species diversity that were of species that were already there? Sort of like this species that has come from far away is an invasive. Mm -hmm. And how does that impact the ecosystem it moves to? Well, I think um, <coughs> there aren't too many cases where we have a long distance dispersal event where a species arrives into a, uh, an already species rich environment and diversifies. Um, I think in the case of the Andean region, I think a lot of tax are arriving there and then entering in uh, an occupied space. And so they're able to diversify just like through island you know, diversification without too much competition. And, and at some point, there, there may be a point where there's no longer much space to invade because there's a certain carrying capacity. But in the dispersal events that I, that I mentioned, there was never, you know, apart from the Andean colonization, there was never much uh, speciation after the long distance study, uh, or, or at least not rapid. So how did you calibrate those meta-analyses that you just showed us? So those meta-analyses don't have any kind of time calibration on them. So they're just looking at the speed of based on the numbers of nodes, sort of the relative rates. So they don't really, they don't really try to put gauges on those. And, uh, and we probably wouldn't trust any, any kind of age estimates that we would put on them. There's just not enough of a fossil record for this, for this taxa. We can just show whether there's an increase in the rate or, or a decrease. <coughs> and it's also, you know, some of these methods are dependent on taxonomic sampling. And so, um, you know, and how, how extensively the sampling is done. So that there are many limitations of this kind of analysis. So um, I'm trying to just sort of understand what those limitations are, and what questions we can address. Among the uh, more recently diversifying species, do they still cross hybridize and produce hybrid progenies? Um, well, I'm only very familiar with the Yinga, and uh, those species, to my knowledge, are very morphologically distinct and without too many intermediates. And they also tend to have widespread overlapping distributions. So it's not as if they uh, speciated in small, isolated valleys and then having that contact. But somehow they manage to speciate and then develop reproductive barriers to develop wider overlapping distributions. Um, for the other groups up in the Andes, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know that case is because. Yeah. Can you have a, a population that's widely distributed and then have it interrupted by the Andes? How can you can you rule out dispersal over the Andes to account for the similarities between the two components? Yeah, that, that was the main question. Is um, like with that Peter Raven sort of suggested this as a sort of a vicarian scenario um, where the Andes just divided the populations. Um, but the alternative hypothesis is some kind of dispersal. And what would be nice to do would be to get enough taxes to just determine whether that's been the case. And there are some relatively low areas in the Andes in 2,000 meters where conceivably in some warmer periods of time there could have been some kinds of dispersal. 
And there also could have been dispersal in that sort of what is now the Llanos, sort of along the slopes of the mountains. There are other possibilities. And also, like in the case of Symphonia and Seba, uh, plants could have gotten around through oceanic currents as well <coughs> before the before the Isthmus of Panama and so that, that's always the, the alternative, dispersal versus interference. <coughs> um, but I, I think it would be difficult for them to get over the Andes for the most part. It's a real strong ecological barrier. What happens when you start nesting uh, species or genera into higher taxa in your analysis? In other words, do you find that, let's say, at the family level, that some families are prone to rapid diversification and slow diversification? Uh, because there's always this yeah. idea as to, is there something intrinsic to a clade's genomic potential yeah. to morphologically diverse? Well, well, I'm starting to think that about legumes. Um, so I'd be interested in what people have to say about that, but they've got the lupines, they've got the pinga. Uh, the legumes are, are a dominant family of trees in the rainforest around the world. Um, so there might be something, uh, there might be certain groups that really can diversify for some reason, they have a propensity for some reason or another. They have to do with their, with their reproductive biology or chromosomal. Symbiosis. Symbiosis. In that case, not yeah. evolution. Mm -hmm. um, but there's no straightforward answer, but I believe that might be the case. Well, I'm surprised the ugly word of polyphony hasn't come up. <laughs> and gene diversification. <laughs> it, it, it did come up earlier, you know, when I had to uh, <laughs> We didn't talk enough about it, but, but I think that, that would be very interesting to look into college work as well. That's what I was fishing for, is genomic <laughs> correlation. Right <laughs> 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 on that particular day. That, 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 uh, that exploration did not escape it. <laughs> I guess that's it. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.